Hello, and welcome to today's live webinar, Software for Microbial Genome Assembly and Analysis. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars and advanced scientific collaboration and learning. It's brought to you by DNA Star. For more information about DNA Star, please visit www.dnastar.com. I'm Bob Woodard of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Before we begin, I have a few announcements to make. First of all, this, this event is intended to be interactive, and we encourage you to submit questions and answers, excuse me, questions and answers and comments during the presentation. To do that, click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window and type your comment or question into the Q&A box that appears on the screen. Also, the presentation will be shown in slides in the slide window. You can enlarge the slides by clicking on the screen icon on the lower right of the slide window. And finally, if you have any technical difficulties viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button in the upper right of the presentation window, or let us know what's going on by using the Q&A button on the lower left. And we'll try to fix the situation as quickly as possible. Now I'd like to present today's speaker, Matthew Kaiser from DNA, from DNA Star. Matthew is a senior manager of next-gen sequence and applications at DNA Star. He has worked there for the past 11 years. And for the last eight years, his focus has been on next generation sequencing. Please join me in welcoming Matthew to today's presentation. Thank you, Bob. And thank you for joining us uh, uh, this afternoon. So today I'd like to focus on one of the NGS workflows in the DNA STAR software suites, and that will be microbial genome assembly and analysis. Uh, before I get into the workflow, uh, I'd like to give a little bit of background on DNA Star. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with us, we're located in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, we have a nice picture here of our capital in, in Lake Monona, and uh, it actually looks like that today. Uh, oftentimes, this lake is covered with ice and snow, but it is nice and warm today. So DNA Star produces uh, many different types of software. Uh, we're going to be really focused in the genomics area today, uh, but we have three main areas, molecular biology, structural biology, and genomics. And we have a comprehensive suite of software then for each one of these uh, key areas. The molecular biology area uh, provides many different tools for things like uh, multiple sequence alignment, uh, sequence visualization and editing. Um, we have nice uh, colorful output from many of our different programs and really a, a powerful palette of tools for working with both DNA and protein sequences. We also have some new protein analysis tools. We have an award-winning uh, protein uh, folding algorithm program called NovaFold um, and some excellent visualizations of, of proteins. Uh, we do have webinars on these other topics. If you visit our website, um, you can see multiple other web webinars that cover these, these topics. Uh, today, again, the focus is on genomics. And in, in particular, it'll be microbial genome assembly and analysis. And so our genomic software includes uh, both assembly software and visualizations and annotation software. And we'll uh, look at some screen captures and we'll go th through that in some detail later in the webinar. Uh, DNA Star has been producing research grade software for uh, a number of years. Uh, if we look at the number of publications, uh, we have more than uh, twice, twice as many as our nearest competitor. Um, so we've been in the market for quite some time producing research grade software. One of the key aspects to DNA Star software, in a, you know, in addition to the software we produce, is the support that we can provide. And uh, we have worldwide support. Um, we have office hours. Uh, uh, here in uh, central time zone from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. And we have global locations as well. So we have distributors our, of our software um, uh, throughout the world. So you can generally get a hold of a DNA Star rep by phone, by email, by chat. Uh, we also do uh, live webinars one-on-one -on -one to support our customers. We also have uh, recorded monthly webinars that are on specific topics. And so, and, and they're archived as well. So 
if we don't happen to cover a topic today that, that you would like to learn more about, this is a great resource on our website. Um, and you can go through, you know, all the way back to 2012, um, these hour-long webinars that go through a variety of topics, both, both NGS and molecular biology and, and protein analysis uh, in, in some detail. We also have an extensive video library on our website. The, the videos are YouTube videos that are anywhere from between one and maybe uh, eight minutes long. Uh, they're on all different topics. So you can see that we have things, uh, you know, cloning and gene detection, NGS workflows. Um, we have with, within the NGS workflows, there are specific workflows to different platforms, Ion Torrent or Lumina and PacBio and so forth. So these are, again, great resources to learn more information about specific topics. So our NGS software is compatible with all the NGS platforms. Um, right now it's primarily Illumina, PacBio, and Ion Torrent. 454 uh, is being uh, uh, phased out. Uh, we are looking ahead to, to some of the nanopore technologies. Uh, and so as that technology enters the market, uh, we will have tools that will be compatible with any of the uh, future long read technologies as well. Uh, this is one of the key uh, points for our commercial software is that uh, we can handle all different types of data. And so most software, open source software in particular, would be specific to a certain uh, data type. So it is flexible enough to accommodate all the different platforms and all the different, um, uh, all different specific uh, qualities that these uh, sequence reads might have. Our software also has flexible access. So we give you different options for where and how you can run the software. Uh, that can include software that runs on a desktop computer um, to network licensing, to key server licensing. So you can install the software on multiple computers um, to give access to many different people that can share licenses. We also have cloud workstations. So you can run our assemblies up on the Amazon hardware, assemblies in the cloud. You can also have assemblies up on Amazon or, or, or use any of our software on an Amazon workspace computer. So if you are constrained with uh, the hardware that you have, these are great options. Or if you're traveling or you just don't have access to your, your desktop or your laptop computer, the cloud options are really uh, nice options for you. So to run our NGS software, uh, there are some hardware requirements. We try to design the software to be optimal running on a, a, on a modest computer. So for example, you know, a laptop computer with 16 gigs of RAM and a hard drive that can handle scratch, uh, excuse me, uh, temporary files that we call a scratch disk. Um, we can plug that into a laptop and have some storage and we can do things like human exome assemblies or RNA-seq assemblies. Um, I can also just run, use my laptop and run my assemblies up on the Amazon hardware. I can launch the assembly locally. So um, it, it really gives us nice flexibility then in, um, in assembling NGS data. You do not need a big, powerful Linux workstation or cluster to do these assemblies and alignments, you know, really these modest computers. And again, if you don't have the hardware, um, you can get access to the Amazon cloud and, and the user experience is very similar to running a local assembly. You set the assembly up on your, uh, your laptop computer. Um, what happens then is the data uses a secure protocol to upload it to the, um, the DNA Star cloud drive on the Amazon server. Uh, and then the assembly runs up on the Amazon hardware. And there's some advantages here beyond just not having hardware. Um, one of the advantages is uh, you can run multiple concurrent assemblies. So for example, if I have 50 human exomes that each take a couple of hours to run. I can launch all 50 at one time and the next day have 50 or really in a few hours, 50 completed human exome projects. So it is a very, very convenient uh, way to do assemblies. So one of the first questions that we get with any kind of desktop software in particular is uh, what is the performance? You know, you know, can a modest piece of hardware, you know, compete in terms of performance speed with software running on much more expensive and powerful uh, hardware. And so I like to show this, uh, this benchmark. And the benchmark has human genome. Let's see, I'll just try to grab a... So you can see human genome at 36x coverage, uh, about 12 hours for assembly time. And what this time includes is both the alignment of the data to the reference genome, 
all the SNP calculations, so the creation of all the SNP files, and building all the BAM output files that are visualized downstream in the DNA Star software. So it's really from start to finish, you know, roughly a 12 hour assembly time. Smaller projects like human exomes um, take under two hours. So a 50X coverage human exome, you know, we'll call it a couple of hours. And things like cancer panels or microbial genomes, we measure those in minutes. So smaller data sets are, are very, very quick. Uh, and that really means, you know, you can run a large number of samples, again, on, on fairly modest hardware. Now, the other aspect to our software is the accuracy. And it's really, really been the focus for DNA Star for the past, you know, a little bit over a year has been to improve the accuracy um, as much as is possible. And right now we, we have an accuracy of about 99.7% for uh, SNP detection in human data sets. So these are large validated data sets. Um, there's a, a link to our white paper on our website where there's a comparison of our software to um, the Illumina standard, which is the BWA aligner and GATK SNP caller. And so there's a link there that can show you how we did the comparison. It's using the genome in a bottle uh, data set, the reference data set, uh, that's highly validated. So you have to have a really, really accurate answer in order to determine that your accuracy is close to 100%. And it wasn't until that data set was made available that we were able to really fine tune both the aligner and the SNP caller to get what, what we think is the most accurate assembler and SNP caller uh, on the market. So our software um, supports all the different NGS workflows. And so what I'm showing you here is the starting point for uh, our, our, our workflows, and that's in Seekman Engine. And so Seekman Engine is a 64-bit program that runs on Mac, PC, and Linux. And you can see we can choose different project types and you know, ranging from genome assembly to exome to panels to transcriptome, chip seek, viral, host integration, metagenomic. So as you make your selections, uh, this is really a project setup wizard. If you make a selection for genome assembly, the next wizard page will be choose the type of genome assembly. And that's what we're going to focus on today are the types of genome assemblies and the different tools that our software can offer. And so that includes a templated assembly that produces a BAM output file. And we also have a de novo option. So that uses a de novo algorithm. And then there's some uh, other, we won't go into detail with the automated gap closure, but there's some other algorithms here as well for specific uh, types of projects. So for microbial genome assembly, um, closure and annotation and visualization, um, there is uh, some questions that need to be answered um, early on in the, in, the, uh, in the process. And I spend a good amount of my time working with customers through different types of projects. And microbial genomes are, are often challenging because it's not always clear what the best approach is to assemble the genome. So for example, uh, some genomes have very close reference genomes. And, and really, the differences are just SNP-like. So the easiest type of assembly is when the only differences are a handful of SNPs. You can use the reference genome to guide the assembly. Um, and that produces a, an output file then where you can just export a consensus and get your new genomic strain. On the opposite, opposite end of that spectrum are organisms that do not have anything close at all in the, in the, uh, in the databases. And so if you have a more novel organism, then really the approach has to be more de novo. So it may be a de novo assembly followed by a de novo closure and annotation. And those can be quite difficult. And then there's some that are in between where it's not, and that, that's where most of them lie, are kind of in between. We're not really sure, do we have a reference genome or do we have to go de novo? And most customers' projects kind of fall in the middle, and that's where the support at DNA Star really helps. We can look at a project, quickly determine what the best path is for you, and then our software can provide um, solutions to both paths. So we'll start with uh, what's on the the easier side of the spectrum, and that's reference guided assembly. And so again, with our SeekBand engine, we start by creating a new assembly project. We pick genome assembly, templated normal workflows. So each time we click the next button and it advances us. We enter a project name. We 
and then we add our input files. And at this point is where we pick the best possible reference genome. Um, sometimes it's unknown what the best possible reference genome is. Uh, and we do have some tools. I, I don't have the slides to show you, but for example, I could pick a metagenomic workflow. And our aligner can easily align your sequence data to 4,000 bacterial genomes all at one time. You know, and so in, in a couple of hours, we can take an unknown sample and figure out what the best possible reference genome is. So again, that's a, that's a different workflow. Um, there's also, uh, I could load VCF files in. So you may have a reference genome that has a list of variations um, that are interesting or positions along the reference that are of interest. The VCF file keeps track of those positions. And if you have a VCF file, you can use that to enhance your analysis. Or alternatively, uh, you can create a VCF file in our software. So if you align to a reference genome, find differences, um, we can find those through a SNP report and say create a VCF file from those differences. So we work well, DNSR works well with novel or non-model organisms um, by creating VCF files which are typically only available for, the, for model organisms. So once we've uh, picked the reference genome, we select the read technology. In this case, I have Illumina data, and I've loaded in paired data. And it'll prompt you for a pair distance. That's the distance between the forward and reverse pairs. I've loaded in two FASTQ files here, uh, Illumina FASTQ, and they're actually mate pair data. So they're about, well, excuse me, these are, are paired end data, so they're 500 base pairs apart. You could have mate pair data, it could be 5,000 base pairs apart. The algorithm will use that information to help with structural variant uh, analysis. And in a de novo assembly, that's what we'll use to uh, create uh, genomic scaffolds. Uh, there's some basic assembly options here. Um, with Illumina data, we generally just stick with uh, what's default. Although I would change genome ploidy to haploid, which is not done on this wizard. And that really just affects the SNP calling. So we'll get a, some accurate um, um, genotyping calls if we can select the, the correct genome ploidy here. There's some advanced options as well that I'm not going to go into, but there's some more knobs and dials we can adjust to improve our assemblies. So at this point, the assembly is ready to begin, and we get a script file that's written um, that guides the assembler. And when we click assemble, we can watch the progress of the assembly. And then when it's done, we get an output file that we can work with in the downstream DNA star tools. So here is um, a view in our Seekman software. And again, this is a, this is a close, easy reference genome. And the way I know that is by looking at these different views. So for example, this is a strategy view. And these thick green areas, you can see it says depth of coverage and pair consistency. So this is a, a histogram of the coverage across that reference genome. And you can see it's about, it's kind of hard to see on the, my screen, it's a little bit small, but it's about 50x coverage across the genome. And you'll notice that it's pretty even across that genome. Maybe there's a hint of a gap here. Maybe not, it might just be a thin area. So when I do my assembly, I can immediately open the project up and then assess the quality of the assembly. So what I'm looking at is depth of coverage, across the genome. There's also a pair consistency plot, make a little arrow there. And that is the pair coverage. So that is the four reverse pairs. Do they have coverage across the whole reference genome? Um, if they don't, there'll be gaps there. So if there's um, differences, structural variations, you'll see gaps, you'll see other artifacts where there's no pair consistencies across say a novel insertion element. Um, so they show up pretty clearly. And I'll show you some examples of that too. Um, what I have, uh, a couple of kind of screenshots of um, pair distances. It's a structural variation report. So the structural variation report is showing, I have it circled here, but 35 structural variations total in the whole genome. That's a relatively small number. And the SNP report right here shows 29 SNP positions. And I can look at those SNP positions and just see, well, there's a handful of SNPs, but 29 SNPs across you know, a five megabase genome, that means these genomes are very, very close together. So I can quickly assess and say, these are close enough that if I wanna produce my new 
genome, all I have to do is export a consensus sequence out and begin annotation work. So this is showing you kind of the easy, easiest case. And so from our software, I can export to another program that gives me different views. This is a fully editable uh, Seek Builder program where I can look at circular maps, linear maps. I can uh, adjust features, move features around on the map, name them, apply restriction enzymes, um, create nice pictures. And again, I can manually annotate here or blast and bring annotations in. So there's a, a number of different ways that I can um, annotate these sequences. So now if I did the same assembly but picked a different reference genome, so if I picked one that was more distant, these same views would look quite a bit different. And if I look at the strategy view, I'll see now that there's this depth of coverage histogram, there's lots of gaps, right? And you can and they really pop out. And I can also see my pair consistency now also has gaps. And there's some red on the bottom side of the graph. Those are pairs that are not the expected distance apart. Again, that's evidence that there's something going on, like a structural variation. So these may be deletions, they could be insertion sites. The, excuse me, the uh, structural variation report right here shows me now that I have over 3,000, um, oh, excuse me, 1,000 um, structural variations here. And 1,000 var structural variants on a microbial genome, that's indicates that it's a pr you know pretty distant reference genome. In the SNPs, we've got 46,000 SNPs now. Right? So I take that evidence together and say, well, this genome probably isn't close enough to really guide the assembly. You know, maybe a de novo approach is a better approach. So um, customers that are using our software, I say, you know, try both. Do a de novo assembly uh, aligned to the best possible reference. Then we analyze the results and pick the, 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 the path of least resistance to you know, closing the genome and, and doing the annotation work. So the de novo uh, project setup in Seekman Engine is, uh, has some different inputs that, that are required. And you can see there's de novo assembly, and then there's also one that um, uses, it's kind of a hybrid between reference guided and de novo assembly. If you have mate pair data and your reference genome is reasonably close, you know, under, definitely under a thousand structural variations, you can use this kind of a hybrid approach as well. Um, and But now we're just going to focus on de novo assembly. Looks like the genome we had is quite different, so we're going to see what, what happens when we just do a de novo approach. So again, the project setup, uh, we name the file. Um, the project now is going to save as a Seekman Pro project file. This is a fully editable format. Um, it has a limit, though, of about 10 million reads. You can maybe stretch that to 15 million reads. Um, so for shorter uh, sequence, sequencing technologies like Illumina, that really limits this fully editable de novo project to small eukaryotes, 100 megabases and under. And of course, you can do all the microbial uh, genomes. Long read technology, though, uh, 10 million reads uh, covers a much, much larger genome. So then medium-sized eukaryotic genomes are possible. Still not the largest eukaryotic genomes, but it allows us to have editable project files um, for much larger genomes when we have um, long read technology. And then we can also save things like uh, contigs and unassembled reads. We have uh, several different options here. Um, the novo algorithms are different than alignment to reference genomes. So there are some different input required. Uh, uh, and we also need to trim the data. So there's all different kind of cleanup operations. Here. So there's quality trim, vector trim, contaminant scans, uh, remove repeats. There's a button here for advanced trim scan options. It brings up a whole page of fine-tune kind of trimming that we can do. Um, most of the genomic data sets, especially from, from Illumina, are quite clean. So it's usually not uh, necessary to do too much trimming beyond quality scores. Um, other de novo assemblies like cDNA for RNA-seq, uh, those tend to have more linkers, adapters, primers still stuck on the sequences. Uh, we tend to use these trimming tools more for uh, those types of data sets. So once we, uh, once we get to this point, we have some, uh, we enter an expected genome length. And there's some additional options, um, minimum match percentage and MER size. 
And really, it's this minimum match percentage that sets the overall stringency for the de novo assembly, much like the, the, the reference guided assembly. It's the single most impactful parameter. So for example, in a de novo assembly, if I change this value here from 93 to 83, for example, what will happen is reads will stick together that might not uh, go together. Um, similar genes might cluster together. I may actually get bigger contigs, uh, much bigger contigs. However, they, they'll oftentimes contain false joins. Uh, and so there's a balance between getting the largest possible contigs and the accuracy of those contigs. And, and we find that about a 93% match for Illumina data is a pretty good balance. And, and what that match is then is the aligned reads to the consensus for that contig. And so this is a pretty good balance. We can also cull out small contigs, and there's more advanced options that we won't go into here. And so we really have a lot of control over how this de novo assembly uh, is going to run. Uh, when the assembly is complete, again, it, it can be opened directly in our Seekman software. And here's a couple of windows that are typical places that we will do our analysis. So we've got, uh, and I'll just kind of show you this project report on the left. Uh, we can see the, the version of software that was used, the assembly time. This took about eight minutes. Uh, we see the number of contigs. Uh, the number of contigs to reach the genome size, that's, that's one I like to look at. In this case, it's 68 contigs, which is pretty reasonable um, for an E. coli genome and it, using Illumina data. Now, as we get better data, longer, more accurate reads, this number is going to drop. 68 quickly drops to you know, 25 if we have the longest, most accurate Illumina data. Um, if we start using things like PAC bio data, you, know, you could get one, for some genomes, one contig assembled, or it could just be a handful of contigs you know, under 10 contigs to reach that genome size. Uh, then the contig in 50, of course, is related to the contig size. The bigger that number is, the better off you are. And then there's some other metrics here in the project report that um, tell us how our de novo assembly went. We also get a contig list. I can see this contig list. Um, this is the summary. And I can see, you know, some of these contigs are well over 200,000 base pairs long and contain tens of thousands of sequences. And this view is interactive then with the alignment views. And so down at the bottom here, that's just the aligned data. And that's fully editable. So this is a Seekman project file. And so I can go in and do micro edits. I can edit the consensus. I can edit individual sequences. It's a great, great tool for interacting now with this assembled data and, and working with it. And so the micro editing can actually be done many different ways. It's hard to show it in slides. It's, you know, in, in, if we have live software, you can, it's a little bit more dynamic, but I think you get the idea. Um, here's a spot that's highlighted where there's an ambiguous place in the consensus. And I use this search tool in our software to find conflict searches, so or differences between the consensus and the aligned reads. And there's some little chevrons down here in the window, and I can move very quickly to find these regions where there's a problem with the consensus call. So I can go through the whole set of contigs, make micro edits, and type in what the correction might be. Or I might not be able to do that. I might say, well, I, I can't tell what it should be there. Maybe we have to you know, get a, a, a Sanger run or something to confirm what that is in that, in that region. So it's a great place to do micro editing. Uh, we can also do contig editing. So micro editing is at the base pair level. I can also look at the contig strategy views. And this is usually where I start, is I just open up the strategy views for all the contigs, scroll through them very quickly. If there's a problem with the contig, it shows up, it really sticks out with this lower plot where you get this area like this that's a, um, where the pair consistency just doesn't exist. And that's a real strong indicator that there's um, a problem with uh, that contig. So I can, uh, place my cursor right in that spot and go to my menu and just split the contig. And it'll just break this into two pieces. Um, I can also look at the contig ends. And in some cases, uh, some contigs, depending on the data set, there can be some noise right in the very end of the contig, maybe a bad read or a chimeric read or uh, that prevents the contig from building larger. I can just select the whole range, hit delete and, and, and trim off the end. So again, these are more editing uh, contigs and masses of sequences, um, which is a nice cleanup to do before we do gap closure. 
once I've done that, I can create scaffolds. Um, there's a, an algorithm. So, so our software does it in two steps. It does the assembly. It lets me look at the assemble contigs, clean them up if needed, visualize them. Once I'm satisfied I have the most accurate con possible contigs, I can um, create these scaffolds. And our algorithm reads the, uh, the, the mate pair, the pair data on the ends of the contigs. And that's what these light blue, you kind of see them right here. Those numbers are pretty small, but you can see there's some numbers there. Those are the numbers to the, for the contig that is just upstream where the mate pair is residing. And so our algorithm reads this information and builds a scaffold off that information. And that results in what we have here, where contig 27 is next to contig 33, and there's a whole bunch more scaffolds. And now I have these dark blue, these little uh, hash marks are actually, um, these are the mate pairs that were used to build the scaffolds. And we can visualize all of this then and really get a visual confirmation that everything is put together properly. So it, it's a, it, an excellent tool for visualizing, editing, um, and then at this point, resolving the genome. We can now focus on the gaps um, and resolve those gaps using additional editing tools in the software. And so we have gap closure tools, and the gap closure tools um, are, again, in our SeqMan software, so we can go and Again, here's a contig 33, 30, and 47, and they're separated by a gap um, that we know is within the, 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 the fragment has to be within our mate pair distance. So if we had Illumina Nextera mate pair data here that's 5 kb apart, we know that the element, the piece in there has to be less than 5 kb. Um, and so we're looking for a fragment to fill that in. And, and there's all different ways to do that. Um, some folks will take you know, design primers um, and generate an amplicon, you know, across, and then sequence the amplicon to fill the gaps in. That's one way. Another way, uh, if, before you do that, you might blast the edges of these contigs and figure out where in the genome this gap is occurring. In E. coli, for example, they often occur at IS elements. So it may be possible, excuse me, just to plug in an IS element, align it together, and then confirm the accuracy by reassembling the data. So it's kind of an iterative process per gap. Um, of course, this is a more uh, labor intensive process, closing gaps. So ideally you have as few gaps left as is possible. So again, that's where having really the longest reads that you can get, the most accurate reads, will result in de novo assemblies with the fewest gaps. Because you, you, you can figure at least, you know, an hour of your time, you know, closing each gap manually, if not more, if you're, if you're not an experienced uh, genome closure, closure person. So in our software, we can identify these gap areas. We can generate sequence fragments. You know, it could be ABI data. It could be a blast fragment from a reference genome. We can add them, enter these sequences into SeqMan. And so we get this list of ABI sequences here. And then we can use the algorithms within SeqMan to splice these sequences into these gap regions and merge these contigs together. And so it's a, you know, a powerful process then we can, you know, splice them together, export a consensus out again, realign all the data, and if you did everything correctly, you should get a perfectly aligned set of data through the splice site. If you made a mistake, it might look like there's a structural variation there. You might not have pair consistency, you may have mismatches and so forth. So it becomes this kind of an iterative process. So you really need a tool like SeqMan that gives you this visual kind of a feedback and a way to lay out the project to really uh, work on it efficiently. Once the gaps are closed, uh, then you can move on to things like annotation work. And so the annotation can be done a number of different ways. Uh, one way is right in our SeqMan software where we can blast um, we, we can blast our contigs and then get blast hits um, with all different kind of scores. And there's a button here, collect features. I can collect features then from those blast hits. And these features then will be pulled onto the consensus of that, of that blasted region. So I can, if I do have relatively close uh, um, sequences in the databases, I can pull those into the project and auto, auto annotate that consensus. Once I've done that, uh, again, I can bring um, 
I can bring those annotations to send them right over to Seek Builder, which provides all different types of um, annotation tools. So I can really focus on individual uh, features. So I can select, say, a feature in, in a linear map like this, and you can see I get all the information you know, down below about that feature. So Seek Builder is a great annotation tool for making it look nice. I can have all different features colored. I have CDSs here that are blue and genes that are green and a source feature. I can make a linear map. Um, I can design primers here. So there's a lot of things I can do in Seek Builder um, to embellish the annotation work. Uh, we also have tools for um, novel gene finding. Um, and so novel gene finding, I know these fonts are really small, but if you have a genome that you can't blast to because it's essentially a novel genome has very weak blast hits, you can use the gene um, uh, discovery tools. And you can see here we've got at the top, we've got open reading frame detection. And so we can apply these methods on the left hand side and they are displayed then in the, the we call it the assay surface in the middle. So I can apply things like ORF detection, stop and start detection. Um, I can bring in uh, features. So here we can see here are two features that came in through my blast, but here's a region in the middle that doesn't have any features. There's a blank area. So that would be a spot where potentially there's so, a gene feature there, uh, but I have to discover what it is. So I can apply things like these are Borodowski plots that look for likely um, coding regions um, with high DNA complexity. And you can see this kind of a plot here. It looks, it suggests that in this area there's some, you know, a gene in that area. So I can use the tools here to identify exactly where that gene starts and stops and hand annotate these kind of novel areas or confirm areas that I've gotten through um, through other methods to you know, verify that they're in fact um, gene regions. So once I've done the annotation, I can uh, move on to genome visualization. Um, and there's, again, multiple different ways I can look at the genomes in DNA star software. Uh, we have the seek builder maps, which give me linear and circular maps. Um, I also have uh, just one little uh, picture here of this is our, our GenVision software that can produce you know, kind of these publication quality. Um, and they're really nice for microbial genome kind of mappings so that we can have uh, information tracks kind of all to scale um, and bring them in together from different areas of the DNA software to make this really nice uh, looking map. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to uh, thank everybody for joining today. Um, if there are any questions, I will be, I'll stick around here for the next 10, 10 to 15 minutes to answer any questions that have come through. And uh, I do have my email um, on uh, where you can, you can reach me and I'll be, for the next couple of days, we'll be answering any questions that, that, that anyone might have. So again, thank you. I do have my email um, on uh, where you can. Well, thank you, Matthew, for that informative presentation. It's Q&A time for Q&A now. And if, uh, if you have questions that you'd like to ask Matthew, uh, please do so now. Just click on the Q&A button in the lower left of the presentation window. Enter your question or comment into the, uh, into the box that appears on the screen and click send. And uh, yeah, so send them now so that if uh, we can get to them. If there are no questions, I would once again like to thank Matthew Kaiser for joining us today and giving his presentation. And, uh, and, and turn the presentation back to Matthew. If you have, Matthew, if you have any final comments and you'd like to make them now. Oh, wait, hang on a second. There is a question coming. Um, hang on a second. There is a question. Yeah, I do have a question. Uh, and the question is, can DNA star separate out multiple tag sequences from a pool of specimens? Um, so, so our software, so typically that's done with uh, barcodes. So we usually will recommend using the Illumina or Ion Torrent demultiplexing software, you know, to separate the sequences into discrete FASTQ files. Once that's done, our software does have a complete 
capability to handle multiple sample projects. So, you know, for example, I could have a hundred bacterial samples and set the, the assembly up in one big multiple assembly kind of a project for the analysis. If there are no, any, are there any other questions anybody would like to ask? Now's the time, now's your opportunity. If there are none, uh, Matthew, do you have any final comments? Uh, joining me today and, you know, and really uh, keep an eye on DNA Star. We're going to have some new tools coming out here later this year and early in 2016 for uh, de novo assembly and long read technology. And again, I'd be happy to answer any questions if they come up, you know, in the next few days, feel free to call me or, or send me an email. Well, thank you once again, Matthew, for your presentation today, and a special thanks to our audience for joining us for today's event. I'd also like to thank uh, Lab Roots for making this presentation possible. And finally, I'd like to thank our sponsor, DNA Star, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Now, before we go, one more thing. I want to let everybody know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through February 2016. Lab Roots will send you an email informing you as to when that webcast is available for replay. Please just pass this along to your colleagues who may have missed today's presentation. That's all for now. Thanks again. I hope to see you soon. Goodbye.